Looks like it's time to start. Welcome everyone to this session of the inaugural Ann Lister Research Summit. This webinar is entitled All About Ann. Uh, my name is Alex Holbrook. I'll be facilitating this webinar. I'm an assistant teaching professor of history at Gannon University in Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, to be introduced to Ann Lister is to want to know more about her. Um, yes, one awesome. year ago, it is, one year ago today, I had no idea who she was, but a year ago this Tuesday was when I finally sat down and watched the BBC HBO series, Gentleman Jack. Of course, my life has never been the same since. No. Um, <laughs> And like so many others, I immediately went in search of more information about the real Ann Lister. And when you know, the first book I purchased was The Secret Diaries of Miss Ann Lister by one Helena Whitbread. And now it's, it's my great honor and privilege to speak with you today. You. Um, so for anyone who doesn't, um, who doesn't know of Helena, just a very quick introduction. I think it's safe to say that there is nobody in the world who has been as intimately acquainted at, for as long as, as Helena has been with the life of Ann Lister. In the 1980s, she pioneered the reading, decoding, and transcribing of Ann Lister's diaries and edited two books of excerpts published as The Secret Diaries of Miss Ann Lister, Volume 1 and Volume 2, No Priest But Love. She's also working on a biography of Ann Lister, much anticipated by Ann Lister enthusiasts worldwide. So Helena, thank you so much for being here with us again after speaking to us earlier today about Maria Barlow. Yes. So wonderful. So we're going to have a Q&A with some questions prepared for Helena about Anne's early life, her interests, personality, or education. And in the last 10 minutes, we'll open it up to questions from our seminar attendees who might want to know more about the real Anne Lister of the diaries. Ready to start? Yes. <laughs> wonderful. Well, let's start at the very beginning. Can you talk about when and where Ann Lister was born and, and give us some context for the class background or status of her family? Yes, uh, well, Anne, Anne was born on the 3rd of April, uh, 1791, in this small town of Halifax, town in which I myself was born, which provided an instant link. Um, she was born on the 3rd of April, 1791, in a house not far from Shibden Hall, called um, St. Helens, and um, Halifax nestles in a sort of a corner of the uh, Pennine Range, and Shibden Hall is set up uh, high above the town, so it's quite remote. Um, the Listers themselves were a well-established family. They'd been at Shibden Hall for a, a number of, since about the 16th century, so the family were well-established. They were landed gentry, and um, Anne was very proud of, of the family's lineage. Uh, they, they were at the top of the social strata in Halifax, which isn't a very big thing to be, but um, in terms of small town, uh, they were definitely looked up to. Um, you know, if, um, if, the, if the listers um, entertained you, then you were indeed uh, very favored. Um, Anne's father was a captain in the military and um, he, he, he was abroad for a lot of, um, we're looking at 1791, of course, it was the era of Napoleonic Wars and um, Captain Lister was sent abroad on various um, military missions, etc. Uh, he was about, uh, he was um, 36 when he married uh, Rebecca Battle, who was Anne's mother. She was an 18 year old heiress. Um, Captain Lister was seen as a sort of hero because he was injured in the Battle of uh, Lexington in the American War of Independence, by the way, mm -hmm. which should uh, resonate with the Americans uh, uh, in a very good way, perhaps. Uh, the British I'm Canadian, I, c I couldn't speak for it, so. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the British were trying to stop the Americans from becoming uh, severed from, from, from Britain, of course, yeah. Uh, so he was, seen as, he was seen as a hero, he was 36. Rebecca Battle, uh, she came from a small village known as Welton on the east coast of Yorkshire and um, their families were related to trade really, uh, which is quite a long story. But uh, uh, William Battle, who was Rebecca's father, uh, was determined that he would uh, get his young daughter married into the Lister family because uh, um, that would be a higher status for his daughter. Um, so. Um, she was only 18, uh, they were married um, in, in, in Welton, and uh, he, he was like a battle-hardened veteran. 
and of course she was uh, she was this shy young young woman who was trying to deal with this military husband but there we go uh, it sounds like she didn't have much sort of sounds like she didn't have much choice in the matter no maybe. he seemed to be uh, william battle seemed to send rebecca uh, to stay with the listers from about the age of 12 you know he was determined that there were there were sort of three uh, three lister brothers all single and i think william battle was determined that rebecca was going to be the wife of one of them mm. and that's jeremy <laughs> yes. mm -hmm. yeah right um, well, that gives us a good a good sense then of the of the environment that Anne was born into. Mm. Um, so so then, what would her life have been like as a young child while she was living with Rebecca and Jeremy? What kind of effect or influence do you think that had on her? Maybe maybe start with Rebecca or her relationship yes, with her mother and father. Well, uh, uh, her father was very much an absent father, as I've said, due to the wars, etc. But um, it appears that she never really formed a loving relationship with her mother throughout the um, throughout the latter's life, which which was rather a shame, really. Um, she was born in Halifax, and um, for she was the second child of the marriage, and and the first child had died in a very young age, John, actually, and um, he'd been born at Welton Hall. Well, Jeremy, coming home, decided that he wanted a Yorkshire heir, rather, um, a, a Halifax heir, if you like. And um, so he, um, he decided to bring um, Rebecca over to Halifax so that the next child could be born in Halifax. Um, so really, you think of Rebecca Battle grieving for the lost son, pregnant with the second child, and she, she, she was a very melancholy woman. She, she uh, sort of couldn't seem to know what was happening to her, you know. And the person that stepped into the breach there, of course, was Anne's Aunt Anne, of which we know about from the film, don't we? What a lovely Very person. Very popular, popular character, yeah. Yes, absolutely. And she provided Anne with the love that her mother should have done in those first couple of years. As Anne says, she, Anne recognised the, the debt that she owed to Aunt Anne days it was her arms that first held me hers that was like a mother's care um, to a friend sibella mclean she wrote um you seem to like the sort of intercourse and feeling between um my aunt and myself uh, there are few such aunts this sentiment is in my heart though little on my lips she took me on her lap the moment i was born and gave me the food, the first food I ever tasted. She lifted me within the pale of Christianity. So all the attendance, all the love, all the care, the feeding, uh, the christening, um, and, and in fact, she was given Anton's name, of course. Yeah. So um, Alan Bray, in his book The Friend, also gives great importance to Anton's surrogate role as a mother in these early days. Um, she was given a, God, a godmother's name, as I say, yes. So, so parted, at, when she was two, she was parted from this loving surrogate mother, Aunt Anne, and they went back to uh, the East Yorkshire coast where um, they bought a place called Skelfler. So the first two years uh, that, were devo that Aunt Anne devoted to her, she was wrenched away from it. Mm. So that sets up a sort of a distance between Rebecca and Anne, right from the beginning of her birth. Yeah. Now, her relationship with her father, of course, was an entirely different sort. Um, his reputation as a military hero made him sort of uh, a, a godlike figure in Anne's eyes. She, she sort of admired and respected him. And, and he also seemed to understand her nature from a very young age. You know, he accepted that she was a tomboy, that she would climb trees and uh, he bought her a first horse and uh, encouraged her in military interests. When Anne showed an interest in firearms, he indulged her by taking her to the gunsmiths and he bought her a, a, a pistol. Um, and um, at, at one point there was a, 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 drug, a, a, a division of dragoons going through town and one of them, a private Maguire, decided to teach Anne to use the broadsword. And um, 
Right. We we see yeah. that represented a little. We see that represented a little bit in the series. Although she in the series she credits her brother Sam with teaching her to sword fight. But maybe that's yes, a, she does. She does because you know. what did she and her brother John they bought wooden swords from the local joiner to practice with. Yes, mm -hmm. but um, she she said Maguire, a private in the Sixth Dragoon Guards, gave me my first lesson in the broadsword exercise. So Maguire was the initiator of the broadsword um, oh, okay. interest. And then her brother John took it up. They both went to the uh, they both went to the shop board broad sword and indulged in that. Do you know how old she was when uh, when that happened? The lesson, the sword fighting lesson. I'm just wondering um, how that soldier would have felt. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think she was in Halifax in about 1806. Would, okay. uh, she would have been, uh, no, sorry. Yes, about eight, about 15. Yes, 15. Like that I believe. Yes, yeah. Um, she did. She did uh, go for various periods uh, to live at Shimden during her earlier childhood, but she didn't seem to go with any of her brothers. I think it was when the whole family was together in Halifax, uh, around about eighteen six, probably. Then, because by that time, Captain Lister was out of the army, so he would have been there to take us by a gun and like that. You know? Yes. Yeah. Well, interesting. Interesting way to grow up, certainly. Yes. Um, now, now speaking of, of Anne talking about herself as a child or as a younger woman, mm. um, Anne apparently referred to herself as a great pickle. Yes. Um, can you explain to us what that means? What did she mean by that? Well, that means that she was always in situations where she was causing trouble or getting herself into trouble, perhaps inadvertently, because, you know, going, going running with her own instincts sort of business, she wouldn't see it as causing trouble, but being wild and uh, uh, unmanageable uh, was definitely part of being, uh, being a pickle, if you like. She'd do forbidden things, such as climbing out of, um, out of her bedroom window. She said, when my maid was not aware, I escaped and I got out of the window and ran into town. And she was always seeing bad things. For instance, um, she would, um, she says here, I got talking about my early life, told her, this, uh, and she was talking to, how I went out every night at Wayton. I drank spirits at Mr. Garrard's, and she was only about 12, 13. Oh dear. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, knew Jenny, oh. I knew Jenny Bunning and Mrs. Cass, told her the latter story of Bill Smith putting his penis on her table and her declaring she would put it off. Brighton saying I should make havoc among the girls, but I had not a, and then she dot, 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 which obviously means penis. Mm -hmm. So uh, these, these people, these rough people, were encouraging her to drink, encouraging her to watch sexual activities that she could not seen. Uh, and, and really it was, that, it was that sort of thing, you know, that, would, dis would describe her as a pickle. She would mm -hmm. go her own way, she would cause mayhem, she would cause trouble, um, and mm -hmm. couldn't, be, couldn't really yeah. be restrained. <laughs> yes, I think that's, it's, wonder that's it's that's wonderful. We're seeing in the chat here, uh, somebody saying, I am also a great pickle. So I think maybe oh, that's right. okay. that people uh, so resonate that. with her. Yes, yes. yeah. Yes. Um, are there other things that she, any other things that you can think of that she says that, ha that have that same sort of self-reflection that she's not only describing her own experiences, but how other people see her? She talks about as, as a child or, or yeah, generally? Maybe as a child, like was she? Was she uh, well, yeah, I, I, know, I know what you mean. You know, that everybody was sort of very um, taken aback, if you like, by uh, her, her, the things that she did or perhaps because as an adult she could be very careful in, you know obviously living this double life wasn't she really you know externally as a, a, a respectable um, landowner etc but uh, then there was the other life that we all know about in the code uh, right. but, um yeah so we'll probably that will come in a little bit later as we talk through about what people think of her you know mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, all right, so Anne uh, just predates the development of photography. Um, so we know her appearance only from a few portraits of Anne, um, if I have that correctly, and her descriptions of herself, her height, her weight that she oh, pushes yeah. from time to time. So can you yeah. describe what we know about what she looked like? Well, uh, the physical characteristics mm -hmm. were 
yeah, uh, her height, she, she was five foot four inches tall uh, and, and she weighed eight and a half stone. She took these measurements at a uh, Pelham Baths in Hastings and uh, she got on the scales and uh, this is what came out. Five foot four inches tall, eight and a half stone. Uh, she never wanted to get um, put any more weight on than that and she moderated her eating quite a lot, you know, to, to maintain that. So I, I have this image of her as um, fairly tall for the, for the era. I think four was tall for a woman. When you think of how tiny the bones were, for instance, you know, they were quite, when you look at their clothes in Bronte Museum, so small, tiny human, uh, a woman of five foot four would be reasonably, reasonably tall. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> in those stand days. out a little bit. Yeah, mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So and I, I see her as being very slim and very energetic. Yes. And so that was her height and her weight. I think we talk. Uh, I think if you look at her stride, the way she walked, she was very manly. Um, she she says her friends that she walked differently and from other people, more upright and and better. And of course, she cried out. I mean, when she went to meet Mariana over the moors, she walked about twelve or thirteen miles in the rain. You know, striding mm -hmm. out in her big black boots and her heavy clothing. Mm -hmm. Her voice, her voice was very deep toned. Um, in fact, uh, people commented on it and said that her deep toned voice frightened them. Women would say her deep toned voice frightened them. Um, and at one point she gave up singing. Because her voice came out so, so masculine. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. So, yeah. Um, I guess her voice probably did, it didn't frighten all women, apparently. <laughs> Some of no, them not. not mind it, but yeah. um, I, I don't know if you if you want to go on to because you were you were talking about her clothing as well that uh, you know her mm -hmm. the way she was dressed that that was I mean in in any time period mannerisms and clothing are are mm -hmm. indicators of a person's mm -hmm. gender yes. and, you, and you manage them right to mm -hmm. to to reflect that so were there sort of idiosyncrasies in her expression of herself her clothes that that she talks about the way she expressed herself yeah the way well the way she dressed um yes how, uh, yeah. well she decided to dress all in black at one point uh, i think she went to um talking about i think um expressing one's gender mm -hmm. through perhaps a uh, visual um characteristics if you like mm -hmm. yes in the autumn of 1817, she decided that she was no longer going to wear pastel <coughs> colours. She gave away all her pastel coloured clothes. She dressed, began to dress entirely in black. Um, she, she said, in, spent the whole of the morning in vamping up a pair of old black chamois shoes and getting my things ready to go and drink tea at Cliff Hill, which was on Walker's home, funnily enough, but the, needless <laughs> to say, they haven't got the relationship together then. So she said, um, I have entered upon my plan of always wearing black. And she never deviated from that, apart from a, a touch of white at the neck, you know, a bit of a rub or a frill, but she never ever deviated from that, apart from, I think um, she went to a dance once dressed in shades, but uh, um, she soon got rid of that. And on the only other occasion, she, she went to Paris and um, she had these little black hats she always wore. And the uh, proprietress of the hotel said, you cannot go out into the streets of Paris wearing that little black hat. You know, everyone will stare at you. You must get a bonnet. Find a black bonnet. So she wore a yellow one, but she <laughs> hated it. <laughs> she put black strings on it to tie it. So. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. Does, somehow doesn't seem to fit very well. <laughs> no. 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 Oh. Well, um, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about her education. Um, her education. Yeah. yeah. One of the things you notice, you know, right away you start to read about Anne is how committed she was to, to self-education. Mm. Um, but, but you know a lot about um, how she was educated in her early life until her yeah. teens and later as well. Can you talk about yeah. that? Well, as you know, her mother, well, her mother was unable to control her, and um, so in 1798, when Anne was seven, she was sent to the Dame School in Ripon, um, a little school run by two old ladies, well, I'm not saying old ladies, two ladies, should I say, Mrs. Cake and Mrs. Yes, she was whipped every day to get tomboy out of her, except for holidays, yes, which was severe, although I think more in sorrow than in anger. 
because um, she was very clever, very quick, very bright, and apparently the two ladies were fond of it. I don't know why they would have to think uh, she had to be whipped. Her mother was anxious about her. Her mother spent her whole life being anxious about her daughter. And the price for writing at the room was silver pen. And it was awarded to Anne. So, you know, and um, also um, there were other accomplishments that she was praised for, most particularly her dancing. And her mother wrote at the people at Dibbling Hall and she said, um, was you to hear her read or repeat, you would be highly gratified. Mr. Noak, the dancing master, honoured honored me with a public day that I might see how much he excelled in dancing. And you get this note of anxiety that uh, Rebecca's wanted to impress people at Shibdi Hall that, look, Anne's becoming civilised, you know, <laughs> <laughs> she's no longer the rough little uh, pickle, you know. Mm -hmm. So they go on, she says, um, she really does dance in the most elegant style I ever, ever recollect using one of her age dance in my life. I thought Miss Taylor danced well last winter, but she did not dance half so well as Anne. There was an assembly whilst I was at Ripon, and the night before I was highly entertained with the Miss Robinsons and Miss Brown, three of the smartest girls in the place, all having a lesson from Anne, how to make a step. <laughs> so the dancing, the silver pen, you know. So that was her time at Ripon for two years. And then in 1802, um, Anne was living at Halifax, she'd been home with her aunt and uncle, uh, as she used to seem to have to go there periodically, probably to give her mother a break, I should imagine. And um, during that time, she attended a local school run by the Miss Mellins, a little local school. And um, she, uh, it doesn't say much about her time there actually and uh, while she was away uh, Rebecca had lost her second son uh, and uh, so she was eating melancholy again at home but skeletal so I think they said like can't deal with Anne can you please stay for a few months you know so she was in Halifax for that little period and then um, she had to go back in 1803 back to skeletal and her education was taken up by the by the the vicar there, Mr. Skeldin, and she took. Um, she went to him for an hour each morning, and um, he took Latin and heraldry with her. Actually, and she stayed there for an hour. Um, but by 1804, she'd set herself a very formidable program of study. That she. This is when she began to start sort of self-education, if you like. Mm -hmm. And um, she were, and she was to do this for the rest of her life. Um, it, she even, uh, you know, decided to teach the younger brothers uh, Latin. So Captain Lister wrote that she's making her brothers Latin scholars. So <laughs> there we go. Then it began to get a little more serious, her education. In 1805, she was sent to the Manor School in York. And of course, this was the beginning of a very um, different phase of Anne's life, because it was there that she met Eliza Rain. And Eliza Rain was her first um, actual physical mother. Uh, they shared a, um, a room called the Slope at the school. Now, it was a bit odd that those two girls should have been in that room. Normally, the dormitories, there were six or eight girls in each dormitory. But Eliza and, and um, Anne took in the Slope. And now, Eliza was Anglo-Indian, of course. Yeah. Right. Oh, I was just going to say, is that sort of the, is that the attic? Yeah, yes, I've been up there. I went up there. Yes, it's uh, oh, oh, the attic up there. And of course, the, um, yes, so there she was at the manor school. Um, but she was so interested in the girls that uh, she wasn't doing any work. And one man who'd attended there as a doctor said that um, she, she caused such havoc. Uh, it got around the rest of the school that, all the girls' passions were so excited and it was quite shocking, uh, this doctor said. So uh, obviously she was causing mayhem at the school. She lasted there, I don't think she lasted there a full year. She, she was, they were, uh, her parents were asked to bring her away from school. So away she had to come. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the next phase of her education took place uh, in Halifax. Captain Lister was out of the army by this time and the whole family had moved to Halifax. And there again, she took lessons with the local vicar, Mr. Skeldin. And she took, um, she was already fairly proficient in Latin. She took on Greek and um, 
and then other things were added to the curriculum, geometry, various branches of mathematics. She studied music. Uh, she was taking singing and harpsichord lessons. Um, she obviously in bulk books, she was buying them as much as she could. So uh, she had quite an intensive education with, with Mr. Knight and under her own volition as well, doing her own studying. Yeah. So that went on just, well, for about a year. And then um, from 1809 to about 1817, there's not a lot we can find out about what went on in her education. There are, um, the, the journals were missing for about uh, six or seven years, which is really sad because we would have known a lot more. Uh, the, next, the next thing we know is that, that in 1817, you know, after the, um, the affair with Eliza Rain, uh, which went on from 1806 to 1810, and then she met Isabella Norcliffe. So Eliza was, um, you know, the affair finished, and you know the sad story of Eliza Rain, no doubt. Yeah, then from 1810 to 1812, she had a an, an, an sexual affair with Eleanor Norcliffe, but Eleanor Cliff in, in um, Mariana Belkin. So by 1812, the big love of her life had started, but we know nothing of that in 1817, see, mm -hmm. by, uh, well, 1816. And then there was a part journal, and, and Mariana had married, and um, so she was left desolate. So what could she turn to but her education again? Right. Went back to Mr. Knight and, and started studying. She studied the classics, mathematics, Latin. Um, but uh, she also went to uh, lectures in the town on galvanism and astronomy. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah, so, so really, she got to the pitch then where really she, she felt Halifax is too small for me uh, educationally. I need to expand my interests. I need to go to the continent and study. But that's a whole new, that's a whole new departure. Oh, Just yes. The Halifax one. Yeah. Right. Yes. So, so those years, 1809 to 1817, she was getting more of a social education, I'm guessing. Well, it's, I think she was concentrating on the love affair with Mariana <laughs> and buzzing around in York, going to the assembly, the balls, and, you know, yes, yes. But then it all collapsed when Mariana... Um, married. Uh, she went. She went with um, with them on the honeymoon. You know, she stayed with them for six months. Like that, yeah. Yeah. Really. Yes. So um, she was heartbroken, of course. She says, "Imagine my feelings on the first night when I put them, more or less, put them both to bed, as it were, meaning that she allowed Mariana to go to bed with Charles." Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Needed something else to focus on after yeah. that. I'm sure. And Mariana's sister was there with them, and she knew she knew about Ma uh, Anna and Mariana, and she was she was a sort of needling Anne about, "Oh, how do you feel about her going to bed with Charles?" You see, but Anne was being very blase about it. Right. Yes. Yes. Something she could confide in her journal, I guess. Uh, yes, absolutely. Oh, reams of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, I think it's going to go on to the the next thing we were talking about after her education. Uh, you've ref you've mentioned a couple of things that sort of touch on this, but I wonder if you could expand a little more on her cultural interests. Interests, yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, um, well, languages she could read, of course, mainly Greek and Latin. And she did. Uh, we look at the authors and reading the authors that she enjoyed. They were most of the ancient classicists, Greek and Roman. Um, ancient world, which you know all about. Yes, yes. <laughs> a little bit anyway. Yes, yes, that's right. Um, she wasn't a lover of novels. Um, she, she castigated the craze for novel reading. She said, um, you know, it, it, it was a, a condemnation of, fi of fiction. It's evident in, in what she said when she was reading uh, the novels of Walter Scott to, to uh, Emma, to one of her friends. She says, uh, Emma likes Walter Scott's novels, Waverley, etc. That was the only one I had read. And foolishly enough, said I, I thought people's time might be better employed in reading other things. <laughs> it was stupid enough, the novel. So that was a, you know, she really did not like it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the reasons was novel reading, like music, as we will come on to, 
was the fact that um, it stirred emotion in her, you see, and she couldn't deal with it with, with the great upset over, over Mariana's marriage. Uh, if a novel was sentimental, if music was sentimental, it brought out too much emotion in her. And uh, she said um, she can read these novels with a sort of melancholy feeling, the very germ of which I thought had died forever. And she says, I'd have to leave novel writing. I must, uh, novel reading, I must strongly occupy myself with other things. Yes, yeah, so it was the emotion that music and novels could generate in her. So. It's interesting that you say that because I think in the discussion yesterday with uh, Anne Shoma and Anna Clark, um, mm -hmm. where they were discussing Anne Lister and sex, they were discussing the fact that she did read classical works that were quite oh, erotic. Yes. Um, yes. And that, that, that yeah. definitely stirred feelings, but maybe not the feelings you're talking about, no, the, no. the tenderness, the... the no, uh, um, particular works of interest were, um, yes, uh, you know, the classics really. Uh, yes. And, and um, her, her uncle kept a, a library of them, you know, and some of them, obviously, a lot of obscenity in them. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and, and she would read them to the point of where she had to, um, um, well, yes, must be, really. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. her across, right? Yes, I know. She, uh, she would say, I read so-and-so, um, uh, particularly uh, the... the um, uh, satires of juvenile and things mm -hmm. like that. It's quite raunchy stuff. You know? and she'd say, oh, yes, I, I remember that from undergraduate <laughs> reading those. <laughs> Satire of juvenile, yes. Mm -hmm. Where mm -hmm. it was uh, talking about two women who rode each other under the moon. Right. Yeah. And she said, I would read until good and evil preponderated in my mind, but evil always won out, you know, mm -hmm. being in self gratification. Yeah. Oh. So, but but she she also loved the classics for the for the, for the you know the the um, general sort of education that she was. Doing. But she she always remembered the very lewd bits, you know. And she would tell tell, tell friends and you know what happened. You know? Yeah. Well, they wouldn't have had access to that. I mean, no, she kind of had people looking for it, right? She had her uncles, um, yes, and she could read them in the in the originals. Yes. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Well, well did, did she have any particular interests in, in musical styles, like uh, instruments that she liked to hear played or, or um, anything like that? Well, I was looking at that, and throughout her education, her musical interests were catered for, really. Um, in 1807, she began taking music lessons with Miss Stafford, who was, the, who was the musician at the church, the organist of the Halifax Parish Church. So she... Uh, she she played the flute and the harp chord, and um, apparently she could also play the organ because at one point her mother wrote um, to the enlisters at, at Halifax, on Sunday next, Anne is to play the organ. It's a, certainly a charitable act, as the young man is under a penalty of £40 uh, unless he procures somebody to pay for him in his absence, which would be um, an expensive and very difficult matter. Yeah. So forty pounds, though. Oh, she sure, because that, that would be a heck of money in those days. When you think servant's wage for a year would be ten pounds, you know. Oh yeah. wow! Yes. Mm -hmm. I might awesome. look back at that again and make sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so she did have these music: the flute, the hot squad, the organ, and um, the, when they were, when she went to soirees in the town, they would try and get her to play and sing. But she wouldn't play, but she earlier. <laughs> Yes. Right, so she sang when she was younger, but not so much yes, as she, she did, but became self-conscious. Self yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, and of course, um, a travel, a travel books were another form of um, education, if you like. Yes, yes, right. they, they sort of part of her um, interest. So, and um, music concerts at York, she would, she would go to those, where the renowned opera singer, Madame Catalani, uh, um, was here. Yes, so... Um, Really, her musical interests were quite well catered for, I would think. Um, she, she went much more, um, if she was passing through uh, London, for instance, or, or when she was in Paris, um, I think what she realised is that she began to travel, that again, the limitations of Halifax weren't really enough for her culturally, although it, it has a reputation as a musical town or had in, uh, in Anne's time. Hmm. And um, still may have, 
But then uh, as she travelled, of course, and as she, as she rose higher in the ranks of the society, when she got to know the arist aristocracy, she began to think um, she began to expand her cultural interests. So she went to classical concerts and she went to the theatre and uh, in London and Paris, places like that. Um, when she was passing through London, she would stay at uh, Webb's Hotel in Piccadilly, and from there she would uh, visit the theatre, she went to the opera in Drury Lane. Um, she went to see um, an opera by um, von Weber uh, called The Free Shoot. She was impressed by the grandeur of the performance. You know, what she said was, it was altogether the most singularly terrific spectacle I ever saw or heard of as introduced upon stage. And um, then she went to, you know, she would go, uh, she went to another one and then coming away from the main house, she walked around the saloon uh, in, the, in the opera house and she said, um, she was noting that in the mirrored recesses, there were none but femmes galants. In other words, prostitutes. Oh. If, uh, they would not have been known but by the volume spoken by their eyes when they met those of gents and by their smile. Um, in walking the streets, the great sign of their profession is a white handkerchief peeping out a little from the top of a reticule. And a little bag would drape a white handkerchief out of it and it was a sign that they were doing business. <laughs> Oh, she's, she's such a student, a student of human. Yes, absolutely. She would pick up on those, on those signals, uh, you know, but of course she couldn't avail herself of them, but uh, she didn't miss anything like that. Yeah. Oh, no, she didn't miss anything. And then she thought to write it down as well, which is. Yes, exactly. We, we, we well, see and think all kinds of things we don't. The intriguing we don't bit, know. isn't it? That's how we find out just exactly what her interests were. And, and uh, you know, it's a little detail. Uh -huh. as well as, as well as, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Well, so, speaking of, oh, I, I was, I was, if you're okay to go on with one of something sort of related, uh, speaking of the little details, um, one thing that gets some attention as people get acquainted with her journals and, and what she writes about is uh, food. <laughs> that she was oh, talking yes. about food, food and drink. Uh, yes. Food and drink. Um, what were her interests, uh, what were her eating habits, um, her, her interest in food and drink? Well, I think I said earlier that she didn't want to weight. She, she wanted to keep her, her weight down to uh, eight and a half stone. So uh, she was very um, sort of a poodle in, at home. And of course, I have to say that the diet that she'd been holding seemed to be very frugal also. They didn't go in for lavish meals or anything like that. You know, uh, they were typical uh, Yorkshire um, frugal people uh, watching the housekeeping and... Um, so for her breakfast, well, well, her day really um, uh, would be, she would rise early, she would do a couple of hours studying, and then she would uh, go out and uh, see to her horses, which would come from later. And, um, and she, it would be about 10 o'clock by the time she was ready for her breakfast, which mm -hmm. usually consisted of boiled milk and, and bread and butter. Mm -hmm. Her and, and her boiled milk. <laughs> We used, call, we used to call it pods when we were kids. <laughs> we used to bread in milk and with sugar in, you know. And um, that was taken at about 9.30 to 10. And um, she wouldn't have lunch. She didn't really eat in lunch. And then dinner would be served about 10, about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, but she didn't want it then. She wanted hers later. So really, from in the breakfast at 10 o'clock, around about 6 o'clock at night, she just no, so um, then they would drink tea round about eight o'clock at night and um, and so to bed as it were. So she was naturally abstemious in her, in her eating and drinking uh, and she often found that the food at Chibian Hall was very insufficient anyway. It was plentiful, it wasn't varied. In fact, one, one day her aunt put on the table a warmed veal pie its third appearance, in other words, it, that was the oh. third time it had been put on the table. All oh, leftover. Uh, <laughs> and potatoes and Savoy cabbage. Well, that doesn't sound very inspiring, does it? No. Um, port wine was a preferred drink. In fact, they all seemed to drink port just a little after lunch, apart from Isabella, who used to uh, drink quite, you know, a lot. 
Um, mm-hmm. In fact, when she came to Shibden Hall, uh, oh, our aunt Ann and Uncle James were staring at her, you know, she might have had a six plus or, you know, that sort of thing, yeah. Wow. So, uh, support then, yes, but there again, she was on steam, yes, she, she, because she worried about her mother, her mother became an alcoholic, you know, and um, yes, and she was very, very frightened, was Anne of, she thought the taint of it might be in, in her system, and so she, she, um, she wouldn't, uh, she wouldn't drink a lot at all. And there was only one instance where she got very, very drunk, and that was when she uh, she visited Mariana at Lawton Hall, uh, and uh, she uh, Mariana had to get her to bed, and she said, "You swore something terribly, you know, while she was under the influence of drink." Yeah. Oh, goodness. Uh, but when abroad, um, Anne would really relish all the good meals in, in the hotels. For instance, they went to, uh, you've been to Paris, obviously, Marisa's Hotel on the Rue de Rivoli, and it's really, really classic. But she went to his brother's hotel, which was another Marisa's. And um, the, the menu was a very well cooked dinner of 15 dishes, soup with a good deal of bread in it, two dishes of fish mackerel and salmon trout, roasted and boiled beef, hashed mutton, vegetables, and afterwards, all these still remaining on the table, fowl, duck, omelette, and an excellent large fowl patty. The tablecloth left on, good dessert brought of dried fruits and biscuits, and we had half a bottle of vin ordinaire rouge, very pleasant, a rather clarity red wine. So you can imagine coming from the veal ham the third time round to all that. So everywhere she went abroad, she would always she would always sort of eat it, what not sort of mm. so yeah. on, you know. Yeah. And then she has to go back to Halifax. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, um, this is this has been wonderful talking about all of these uh these different parts of her life, getting to know her background a little bit. Yeah. Um, I think what we'll do now is open it up to some questions from the Q&A. So I've got some of these in front of me and uh, maybe we can ask you to, to reflect on some of these. Um, so from, I'm sorry, if this is Lucia or Lucia Falzari is asking, um, being Anne like a person you've learned to know throughout the years, she's someone you've gotten to know, you know, and you're still discovering her day by day as we all are. Um, have you ever found something that she's done that left you somehow disappointed? Equally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Anne, um, you know, at some of the things really. Yes. Oh, Anne, yes. Yeah, uh, Can you think of some... Well, th- Miss Valence, for instance, was a little... Um, you know, I sometimes think Miss Valence was a very disturbed young lady, and um, she was going through a crisis because her um, her, her lover had uh, was in prison. He was a military man. She was engaged to him, and um, he he'd forged a check uh, of one of his friends, and that was um, a a punishment by hanging. You know, mm-hmm. and he was waiting in prison for his sentence, and which he got. Yes, and so while she was there at the house party, um, and Anne was sympathising with all the troubles that she had her own agenda in mind in that she was going to see. Yes. So, and uh, yes. I, felt, I felt perhaps she took a bit of advantage of Miss Valence's disturbed state. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, she, she uh, succeeded in seducing her, and then thought at the end, oh, perhaps I don't know, I really shouldn't have. Only a brewer's daughter. Right. You know, Miss Valence was a brewer's daughter from City Hall. And I just sometimes thought during an episode like that, so we do that, yes. But then, yeah, um, <laughs> maybe, maybe not, not the yeah, best yeah. judgment. <laughs> As she said, what, what her, her motto really, but she knew her own weakness where women were concerned, and she would say, um, a woman tater tate is a dangerous animal to me. You know, and she knew her own weakness and she could not resist what was the chance. Um, and, um, yeah, but I, th- I think that, that was her main sort of weakness, really. 
um, we talked about um, was she a fair employer and things like that. Her motto, of course, was um, um, just and firm of purpose. And most of her life, she wasn't like that, but there were these lapses, I'm afraid. But then, who whichever <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, maybe sort of speaking of that, that that one that weakness that she had, um, <laughs> or as Abby Rhodes says here, uh, preference. What did people she was close to know about her preference for women? So her family, the Belcoms, uh, Mrs. Norcliffe. Yes. Do you have a sense of what they knew? I know. Well, I, th I think the person that definitely knew was her father. I mean, at one point, as she was telling uh, Maria Barlow, I think in Paris, said that my father once brought a, a person to sleep with me uh, all night, and he would not have us disturbed till after three o'clock in the, the following day. Well, he wouldn't have brought a man, um, you know, so obviously he brought a woman, I would think. I would think that he knew what his daughter and her sexuality was um but uh the men the men were more aware we, you know one man in new york said i would soon have a man let loose among my women than have Ann Lister. Mm. Uh, those sort of comments were made always by the men really yes so they must, uh, have, they must have recognized the techniques <laughs> yes absolutely yeah. absolutely they would watch her what she was doing you know and um uh her aunt was, was semi-ignorant, I think. You know, for instance, when she got the uh, venereal taint from Mariana, uh, she could convince her, her aunt that she got a toilet seat or something like that, you know, right. or drinking some water that somebody else had drunk and that. But I think her uncle knew well. He gave her the money to get off to Paris to see, see the doctors there. Right. Uh, yeah. So... Yeah. Um, it's an interesting that you say the men seem to be more aware. Yes. <laughs> I just thought about that. Yes, exactly. Mrs. Priestley once said to her, um, uh, what I, you see, I called her sexuality her manishness, her oddity. That was her name for it, yes. And um, she said, um, uh, Mrs. Priestley liked me in spite of my oddity. Uh, what Mrs. Priestley had said to her is that you certainly are very odd. Um, I think nature was in an odd freak when she made you. So uh, I'm sure, and she did confess to Mrs. Beasley that when she did settle down with somebody, it would be with another woman. Mm -hmm. So there were there were hints out there. Um, I'm sure the Belkin girls all knew, of course, because she seduced. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if Mariana wasn't around, um, you oh. know, one of the sisters um, would step into the breach, as it were. Yeah, oh, making a clean so, so they did know. They did know in the intimate circle. Yes. Uh, the funny thing is that both Mrs. Norcliffe and um, and Mrs. Belkin, uh, older women, wiser women, were were very fond of Anne, and and you know sort of a common sense and her advice and everything. But I'm sure that they were yes, but uh, more than pleased to see well, Mariana Belkin's mother, more than pleased to see her married off to Charles. You know? <laughs> but <laughs> yes. Isabella, of course, never married. Yes. No, no, that's true. Yeah. yeah, yes. Well, we're we're just about coming to the end uh, of our of our time here, and I wonder, just as we wrap up, if you could um, answer a question. I think we all would like to know, including me. Uh, what's the status of biography? Ah, uh, yes, this biography. Not, not to put too much pressure on you, but I feel like I feel like Cosabon in Middlemarch, you know, mm -hmm. and that he's writing this book that goes on and on and on. Um, <laughs> I, I, it, it, is only, it does only go up to 1826, by the way, it is the first half, and um, um, it, it's going to need um, a press that will take on something quite large. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, Virago published my, my two books, okay. and I sent, I sent the proposal for the biography to them, but they said it was um, okay. Um, their, their limit is 190,000 words. My biography so far is 500,000. So um, yeah. they said it would need an academic press. So if there are any academic editors out there, <laughs> I would be happy to be approached. I, yeah, we, I think 
I think we, we can we should use the Ann Lister network here and see see if oh, we, can, we can do help that. Out. Do that. That's thank so you. wonderful. Yes. Um, Helena, Helena, thank you so much for yes. sharing oh. your knowledge with us today. Um, yes. You your work has just made such a difference in so many people's lives, uh, mine thank included, you. and oh. uh, we're we're so lucky to have had a chance to talk to you today. That's lovely. Thank you very much for listening, all of you. Oh, yes, okay. and, and keep well, everybody, in this. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Yes. Bye. Bye.